Wow. Good morning. Uh, I love Ruby Conference, except for Keynotes. <laughs> and uh, I love you people. Thank you for coming. Uh, this year, I'm going to talk about the, the, the 0 0.82 language. I, I know you don't know what, it, what that means, but let me tell you about that. <laughs> and uh, a whole earth was a, of one language and of one speech in, in the book of Genesis. Uh, long time ago, it is said in the Bible, we, we had a, we, we the, the people spoke uh, one language, the one true language. They spoke the perfect language. But the, they, they made a very great things and built up a great tower, and the, that, that tower was destroyed. And uh, we, have, we have no longer the same language. Therefore, the, the name uh, the name of the tower is called Babel, and because the law did the confound the language of all the earth, so we did. Since that, so we did speak. Uh, we have spoken a different language, like English, Japanese, Russian. It is correct Russian. I don't know. I just copy and paste. <laughs> <laughs> Correct? Oh, good. And Arabic. Yeah, thanks to Unicode. <laughs> <laughs> and love other language. By the way, this year, I changed my presentation software. The, this one is called Rabbit. It's written in Ruby. Yay. 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 And it understands Unicode. <laughs> And many programming languages. We speak Ruby. Some of them, some of us speak Python. Uh, some of us speak, most of us speak Java. <laughs> <laughs> and some, some speak Go. You know Go language? Yeah. yeah. This is quite interesting language. I, I love Go. But the, the bad thing is it's quite hard, difficult to, to Google. <laughs> and uh, in uh, the backtracker of Go language, the someone posted a some kind of complaint, and uh, that I made up the language name Go in ten years ago. So you should rename the language. I I I came first. And uh, in, the, in that thread, the, everyone talked about the new name or the Google should change the name. They, don't, they shouldn't be evil. evil. And uh, yeah, some proposed to rename the Go language into, oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Yeah, it's, it's quite new for me. <laughs> Issue nine. <laughs> the, just because the, that complaint was filed as an issue nine in the back tracker. <laughs> and uh, yeah, it reminds us a plan nine as well. Uh, we, we speak some procedural language, like Fortran, C, and Pascal. And uh, I started programming in basic, and it was horrible at that time. No, no abstraction, no data structure, no nothing. Just, just line numbers. And uh, when I started l l learn Pascal by book, I didn't have any computer like then, back then. So I, I studied Pascal without writing any line of Pascal code. And uh, it was fantastic exper experience. Uh, I learned uh, recursion through Pascal. I, I learned uh, structure, data structure, a uh, data structure uh, in pa from Pascal, and it helped me a lot when I learned C and other language like Lisp 
or small talk or anything like that. And some of us speak some object-oriented language like small talk, C++, Java, and Ruby. And some languages are functional, like Lisp. Uh, some may feel some kind of uh, reluctance of to consider Lisp as a functional language. It's it's a I don't know parentheses language. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you can easily write a procedure code in uh, in Lisp, but but still it's it's kind of you know the the origin of functional language. And we have OCaml, Haskell, and Erlang. They're each has different aspects, but they are still, still functional languages. Uh, some esoteric language. <laughs> uh, they are language to, to uh, uh, confuse people's brain, like uh, intercal and brain. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> And white space. Do you know white space? <laughs> yes, you know. The white space is the language the, that character contains the white spaces, like space, paths, the, the new lines, and the, that's all. <laughs> <laughs> the, every other character are considered as a comment. <laughs> So it is quite difficult to learn white space <laughs> in a book. <laughs> oh, mata <laughs> machigate. I'm sorry. An APL. And uh, a few years back, I was surprised by, we have every APO characters defined in Unicode. So <laughs> now we can program in APL <laughs> without any special keyboards. Uh, there are so many languages with the different opinion. So the, uh, and naturally each programming language has its designer and they have different opinion about uh, the wh how, what programming language should be, or different the opinion and the different trade-offs or different policies for the languages. So, you know, there's there's no single way to define the programming language. Yeah, I, you know, I'm a. I don't believe in the one part true language. So there's no perfect language, no perfect programming language. Nothing fits all. We have some kind of system programming. We have some kind of the, the number crunching programming or some kind of scripting for waves. So we have the various purposes and various goals to, to achieve in the programming, programming language. So nothing fits all. But uh, nothing fits all. So use your favorite language. And th the language fits your goal. Here we go. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But I have a little more things to tell you. <laughs> <laughs> the key person number one is uh, the Wilfredo, Federico, Domaso, Pareto. Did I get it pronounced right? <laughs> he's Italian. And he's Italian, industrialist, socialist, econ economist, a philosopher. And he's best known by the Pareto principle, or 80 20 rule. Uh, it, that means that roughly 80% of the effect comes from 20% of the causes. It's, it's quite common. Yeah, according to Pareto principles, even if there's no perfect language, there can be a language that covers 80% of the programming task well at a reasonable cost. So there's no, 
even if there's no the one true language, one true language, but there could be the 0 0.8 true language, 80% true language. So I call it the 0 0.8 true language. So I call it ZEP, ZEPET, ZEPET. <laughs> it's quite hard to pronounce. And uh, that reminds me, Japan, <laughs> who to try to create a, a human boy, but made a living per puppet. 80% real boy instead. <laughs> <laughs> so, so in this presentation, I'm going to talk about a little bit about the pet. And to support 80%, we need to understand the common tasks and their, their backgrounds. So, so we have the how for hardware, we have faster hardware, cheaper, and it's ubiquitous. And then, yeah, we we really has a faster computers. PCs are faster than supercomputers of 20 years ago. So you can buy a supercomputer in 20 years ago in a Best Buy or some, somewhere in an appliance shop. And we can buy a laptop PC at the appliance PC appliance stores for four hundred dollars or less. And uh, and the computers are now ubiquitous. No, everyone wants computers. Not only uh, a computer. Uh, almost everyone owns uh, several or many computers. Like uh, this one. Uh, do you have iPhones? Raise your hands. So many iPhones. <laughs> Apple rules. <laughs> and I do, <laughs> actually. But you know, I know we know this. This is a computer. This is a computer. But you know, in these days, usual computers. It's this is Japanese cell phone from Panasonic, and uh, I bought this one for my daughter. And uh, it's, I, I thought it was a typical cell phone, but it has a Bluetooth, MP3 music players, digital TV receiver, and even JVM. <laughs> it's a computer. It's a computer. I was astonished he was, she, she was downloading some kind of the Java, by Java racing games in, into the, the cell phone. And, uh, now everyone is connected by broadband or Wi-Fi and mobile networks, and uh, yeah, even here in the hotel ballroom. And uh, they are cheap, <laughs> not in members in hotel rooms. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, we can buy uh, the hundred meg, meg optic fiber connection for the sixty dollars a month. In Japan, <laughs> I don't know how much that costs in, in the United States or the other countries, but you know, it's quite cheap, at least in some advanced countries. <laughs> <laughs> but everyone gets connected, yeah. And uh, in some countries, like the countries in the Asia or Africa, so it's. The, they, they, don't, they don't put it with the cables, they, they just use cell phones. Yeah, the mobile network is far easier to build up than the, the lining cables. Anyway, so we have Moore's law. That means that the number of transistors in LSI doubles every 18 months. And uh, it's, they, it's almost the, the single reason of the hardware growth in the computer science, computer field. But we are seeing the, the last days of Moore's law. So we no longer see the clock growth rate in, in we, we used to have, like this one. This is the graph that I copied from Wikipedia. And uh, the green line is the, the tr number of transistors. It's, it's a like this. It's exponential. 
lines. The, so the seeing green lines, the Moore law still exists. But the, the dark blue line is uh, the clock, the CPU clock, which, uh, which represents the, the performance of the CPU. And uh, in year somewhere, in the early 21st century, the saturated, that line was saturated. So we no longer have the, the fastest CPU, even though we had the, the, still have the number of transistors growing. So the, the, the hardware vendors, ID, the CPU industries goes to multi-cores or four. We have the two CPUs on a, on a chip or four, eight chips. And uh, we even going to have the many cores in, in the near future. <coughs> Some companies announced that they build up the, the hundreds CPUs, Intel compatible CPUs and a chip. It's quite interesting. And uh, some people goes to more distributed way. So we put many computers into the day center. So just, we just use it. So, and uh, name it as a cloud. <coughs> and for software, the, in our society, the software is getting more and more important. And, uh, we, our society does not go anywhere without computers, and the computers does nothing without, without software, so the importance of the software is getting more and more. But, w so we need more software, but we need more software <coughs> cheaper, just because, you know, the, we have limited number of the programmers, we have limited budget for software, so, even even though we the importance of the software is growing, the uh, budget does not grow that much, unfortunately. So, <coughs> and uh, in these days, every, everything done in web and and network is the computer. The is the this is the catchphrase of the company, which is bought by Oracle. So, according to these backgrounds, the, the basic requirement for the pet is uh, it should be general purpose, and it should be productive, it should be concise, and it should be dynamic. And so, the JPEG should be a general purpose language just because, you know, so even though web dominates the world, almost, but it does not cover 80% of the task. We still have some kind of the GUI programming, the scripting programming, the a lot te testing programming. We have a lot of fields that does not run in web. So it should be general purpose, not web-centric. And then, but I think we can leave out the system programming. So we, we can have the, the, the other 20%, leave it into other 20%. And, uh, but since computer is faster, so the we don't have to focus too much on the performance. And uh, high performance, performance computing, HPC requires special language like Fortran or I don't know, Fortless or some, something other. And uh, the Japan should be productive. So we need more software in cheaper and quicker so that the language should focus on product productivity. And it should be concise. According to the, the Fred Brooks in a mythical month, it says the, the programming programmer generates about same amount of code per day, oh, 500 lines, for example. So he generate the same amount of code regardless of the language. So that means if the, the programmer creates the 500 lines a day, 
So he creates the 500 lines uh, in assemblers, in C, in Java, and 500 lines of Ruby code in a day. So, but think about it, you know, you can do something in 500 lines with assembly, but you can do so many things in 500 lines of Ruby code. So if you choose Ruby or any other productive language, so you can be, the, I don't know, several magnitude better program, you can be a several magnitude better programmer. So the present day application requires dynamics for flexibility. So think about the Java programming, Java application. The, the decent, num decent application with a, uh, a Java application with decent size has some kind of the XML code. So just because the, it requires some kind of dynamics, but Java is a relatively the, the, well, inflexible language or. <laughs> so, so we, the, the Java programmers put some kind of the dynamics required by application into the XML code. So XML is a DSL for Java programmers. <laughs> <coughs> Indeed, I'm, I'm serious, I'm serious. <laughs> yeah, the, think about it, the XML is the best, best syntax for making external DSL. So just because you, know, you don't have to implement the new parser for external DSL, you, Java comes with the, the best XML parser in the, in the world. So you don't have to program it, in, programming in uh, XML parser. The, it comes with Java with any cost. And then, uh, yeah, Ruby, Ruby tends to be to that be dynamic language, but you know, it, recent people programmers use meta programming to uh, to get or abuse more dynamism from the language. Look at the rails. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's quite amazing to to use or abuse <laughs> the meta programming, <laughs> but we need more. Uh, the key feature for the JPET, the new, the, the nearly perfect language, is I think the DSL on distributed programming and the functional programming. So DSL stands for domain specific language, as you know, and the language is specifically designed for a particular domain. And uh, there are two kind of DSLs: one in internal DSL. And the second is the external DSL. The internal DSL means uh, wait. Oh, <laughs> yeah, DSL, DSL has a lot of advantages. Like the, it provides a high abstraction, and it's it provides self-documenting code and quality, productivity, reliability, maintainability, portability, and reusability. Uh, it's from Wikipedia. <laughs> and the variation at the domain level. So even non-professional programmer can be programming in DSL uh, some, somewhat. And uh, there are two kinds of DSL, and one external and one internal. The external DSL means the, the domain-specific language designed and implemented for a particular purpose. And the internal DSL means the, the DSL uh, on top of the host language. So uh, adding vocabulary and some kind of the, the control structure, so making existing language into DSL. So there's a need for productivity in the nearly perfect language. So there is uh, ease of programming for non-programmer is important. and. Uh, by DSL, the one can retrieve expert knowledge in their language-ish. So internal DSL, oh, I, I, I already explained, but the internal DSL is DSL on top of the existing language, like uh, Rails. 
as a web DSL or you know, R specs as a testing DSL on top of Ruby language. It's with the Ruby syntax and adding some vocabulary for web or testing. So it makes it the web, uh, the domain specific language on top of Ruby language. External DSL is DSL is specially implemented for the domain, <coughs> like uh, the XML files in Java or I don't know, Oak, uh, other small, small language in Unix world, or a lot, we, we can see a lot of external DSLs. And then internal DSL provides a familiar control structure. You, know, you can use any, any Ruby code in internal DSL, like in Rails, but still you can keep it in higher abstraction if you want. And so you can learn, uh, learn from the existing language, so it is easy to learn and read. And uh, internal DSA can be implemented by adding some vocabulary, so it's quite easy to implement. But at the, on the other hand, it's limited by host language expressiveness. So if the host language is not really expressive, so the DSL on top of the, the host language is quite limited. Uh, external DSL allows special syntax for the, de dedicated to the task. And it's flexible, so you can design any syntax that's uh, suitable for the task or domain. And it's quite easy to implement only if there's macro in host language. You can eas easily define an external DSL on top of list, uh, uh, if you can stand it, the parentheses. <laughs> I do. I, 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 I see no problem with parentheses. Yeah, Emacs helps. <laughs> but it, you have to learn about new language, new, whole new language for the, the domain, to, for each domain. So, you know, you, you have no clue about new language. So you have to learn from, from the, the scratch. To you have to learn that the new D DSL from scratch. So my bot goes to internal DSL. Ruby is quite easy to make up the new DSL. And uh, some, yeah, as I said before, Rails, RSpec, and other things. Uh, it, actually, uh, the DSL on top of Ruby language. So, in fact, uh, Dave Thomas once told me that the, the creating software is a kind of the step of defining DSL, the particular to that application. So you, you prepare the DSL for the, the application and you end up in the programming unit in that DSL for, that, the, for the specific application. So, and uh, in addition to DSL, the, the distributed programming is quite be become and um, will become quite important. We have no single computer that can handle enormous data of present world. Uh, we genu the humankind generate I don't know hundred exabyte in a year these days. Uh, exabyte? <laughs> it's quite big. And we need to, to use more, more cores and more computers. So we have MapReduce or, the, or Cloud something. So <laughs> it's kind of buzzword. I know, I know. But still, the, I don't care about buzzwords. Like, but you know, the, the importance of distributed programming is still, still real. And the functional programming. Uh, we see some sessions about functional programming in this conference. And uh, functional programming is, be, is becoming very important just because it can be uh, declarative for the task. You can focus on what, not how to, to solve the problem. And uh, it, it opens up the new world of optimization by, for example, lazy variation. 
So in a, in a summary, as a summary, ZPET should be general purpose, productive, and concise, and dynamic. In, and it, ZPET should support internal DSL and distributed programming, functional programming, and uh, questions. Do we already have such a language? <laughs> or something close enough? <laughs> Ruby. Uh, Ruby is general purpose, productive, concise, and dynamic, and fun. That's important. And Ruby supports internal DSL very well, as you know, and far beyond other languages. As far as I know, the Ruby is the best language to implement the, the internal DSL. That's the key, I, th I believe. And, uh, Ruby provides reset literals and blocks and flexible yet complex syntax. So if, if I didn't allow some, op, for example, omitting the parentheses around the arguments, the syntax would be much, much, much simpler. But you know, the, you have to put the parentheses around everywhere. So by omitting the parentheses, argument parentheses, you can write better internal DSL or abuse the syntax to look like a natural uh, language. Uh, yeah, like English-like language. <laughs> so a few years back in this conference, I was uh, uh, surprised to, to attend the session which encouraged to abuse the Ruby syntax to look cold similar to English. You know, English is my second language, or third, or I don't know. <laughs> anyway, so, but my, so he abused my language formed into English. So it's quite interesting. And uh, at the first time I saw the session, I was quite uneasy, you know, <laughs> seeing my language abused <laughs> somewhat. <laughs> but after the session, I realized if my language and my policy to do describe the expression in the language can be used <laughs> to, to make it similar, make the code similar to English, why not? Why not? So I changed my mind. And, and I, I became a true believer of internal DSL. But Ruby is pretty close to JPET, but not yet. We need to have a good support for distributed programming and functional programming for Ruby. We are working on distributed programming like DRuby, Ringer, Active Libraries on a multiple VM in the process. We are working on it, on them, but still underway. Uh, we are working on functional programming too. We uh, added the Lambda expression, uh, which is very uh, unpopular a few years back. <laughs> and uh, we added in the emulator, like a, it, it's kind of kind of like a lazy variation. We added com we can implement Combinator in Ruby and. Ruby provides continuation, and I'd like to add a lazy array in the, the some future Ruby. Uh, as a conclusion, there can be the 0.82 language, and uh, the JPET, that that nearly perfect language requires a productivity, etc. And Ruby is not yet the JPET, but close. And uh, we are working on make it better. So, yeah, you you can uh, attend the session by the Yugui Sang, who who is a one line uh, maintenance lead, and uh, you can hear uh, you can listen about uh, what would be in our near future. We we could have in the near future. Uh, come join us. Working on language design is very fun. Yeah, I bet you.
And uh, you can create a C serial programming by working on Ruby. Just because you know, you Ruby is the leading language for implementing internal DSL. So I, I believe it will change the world in some way. And uh, as you've changed the world, the web field, be a Rails, you know, after Rails, web programming changed. It's kind of like a revolution, as, as uh, somebody said in, in his blog. And uh, I expect more revolution would come with internal DSL. Uh, it's about, uh, it's about, okay, I finished the slides, I think. Okay, thank you. <laughs> thank you.